Sanders, who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's time for the World of Wonder Top 10 Countdown of Things That Make Us Go Wow. wow. I'm Fenton Bailey, co-founder of World of Wonder. I am so glad to be back. I missed you guys. It's been three years. It feels, it feels like it. Ever. <laughs> I'm joined by Tom Campbell, creative director of World of Wonder. Hello, Fenton. Thank you. And James St. James. Hello, darling. Oh, look, it says something new about you. Literary darling. Oh, well. <laughs> I'll take it. And it's a rebranding. <laughs> So, um, we're coming to you uh, from our studio, uh, <laughs> our, our street side studio yes. uh, on Hollywood Boulevard. But without further ado, let's get to counting down the top 10 things that made us go wow this week. Tom, what have we got at number 10? Number 10. One name, tell me what it provokes in you, Alan Carr. Keftans. Moo-moos. <laughs> what is the difference between a captain and moo-moo? If you're um, gay or straight. <laughs> um, I think moo-moos are for girls. But Alan Carr, there's a documentary out called The Fabulous Alan Carr. For those who don't know Alan Carr, he was an amazing producer of many things, but films, Grease being one of them um, in the YMCA, 70s. Or the YMCA. Village can't stop the music. Can't stop the music. It's an amazing documentary yes. by Jeffrey Schwartz. I just saw a screening of it. I don't know when it's coming out exactly, but soon. Jeffrey Schwartz, you may not know his name, but he uh, did the documentary I Am Divine, about oh, Divine, right. uh -huh. and mm -hmm. Tab Hunter, Contra oh, Confidential. That. that was so good. He's done many documentaries, but he seems to be a master uh, uh, of sort of resurrecting or sort of archive, you know, archaeological digs into our gay, forgotten gay icons and pop culture past right. people that have inter that have intersected with the, with the much bigger, and oh my God, is Alan Carr an amazing subject? Now, yes. I, flamboyant homosexual from the day he came out of his mother's womb, he was a Jewish, fat gay guy it's like there was no disguising it it's like and and of course like every smart genius you know under you know uh, under underground gay he became best friends in high school with the pretty girls he became best friends at college with the good looking guys because he had such personality mm -hmm. and he he threw himself into show business and he was like doing plays in chicago he was doing um he ended up booking uh for playboy penthouse which is like playboy after dark in mm -hmm. 59 and oh. and he said something in the documentary because there's lots of interviews with him because he was unlike most people from behind the scenes, he was a celebrity. He was on television right. all the he time. He was on Johnny Carson yes. and Merv yeah. Griffin. And Merv Griffin. But he said, um, he goes, I learned in that job, the Playboy penthouse job, what talent needs. Which is such an insightful thing. What to does say. talent need? We're still figuring it out. <laughs> Constant reassurance. Oh. He believed in people. And for instance, these are things I didn't know. Marlo right. Thomas suddenly pops up. There's great interviews in this with some old stars. And she's like, listen, I was the daughter of a famous comedian, Danny Thomas. No one took me too seriously, but Alan Carr believed in me more than I believed in myself. He got her in two plays that were prestigious, and she got that girl, became a huge star. He also um, uh, managed uh, Roger Smith, who was married to Anne Margaret, who just recently passed away. And he worked. Working with Roger, he turned. Anne Margaret had a huge career in the fifties, and then it got really sleazy in the mid se, mid sixties. Did I say fifties? In the no, late in, in the late fifties, right? In the yeah. early sixties, she was really big, and then in the mid sixties, um, she was doing like bad bikini movies, and he created her Vegas act right. with Roger, and she became the number one. It's like, and then she got carnal knowledge, and, and then she got carnal yeah. knowledge when he was managing her, and she became a serious actress the yes. rest of her life. Um, he saw um, she was in Tommy. I'm going to tell the whole thing, and it's it's we don't have enough time. Time, but he did. He was a master marketer when the movie Tommy came out. Anne Margaret was in it, and he rolling around in baked beans. Yes, but he threw the party in the subway of New York. So all the glitterati, Tina Turner and Elton John, these pictures of them dressed up and partying in the subways. And in we thought the club kids invented <laughs> that. How dare Alan we? Alan Carr. He definitely was. He feels like he was the producer of the disco era, right? Yes. Because yes. Can't Stop the Music was the Village People musical movie. Yes. Right. And then he went on. He did Grease too, as well, which mm. was he. He sort of went on a downward yes. spiral. Yes. Well, it ended. Yes. Well, oh, with wow. the Oscars. But he, it breaks the, my heart because he had such high highs in Hollywood. Yeah. Except him and then he was kind of ostracized at times because Greece was a high high and it's interesting again in the documentary because I love Greece it's sort of like it's a straight high school musical about a straight high school through the lens of the gay boy right uh -huh. and that was Alan right. Carr but he kind of hogged all the, all the credit for that then he did on his own sort of pushing away some of the people that made him 
made, made Greece great, including him. Mm. And he did "Can't Stop the Music" with the Village People. But it's, but it's, it's so good. It's it's a, a, I mean, it's kind of classic. And right? they say it's, it's like a gay man's like 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 acid trip. And that that alone, thank God, it got made. <laughs> um, then he did "Can't Stop the Music." Then he did, then he did um, uh, "Where the Boys Are" another bomb. Oh, but right. then yeah. he went to a theater in France, saw a movie in French. They didn't understand the words, but knew oh, it was going right. to be a huge hit. And he said, "I want to get the rights to make this a musical." La Cage Folle in 1983, and this time he oh, he right brought on. together Arthur Laurent, Laurent the, the 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 producer, and, and yes, he brought um, 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 Jerry Herman, who wrote "I Am What I Am," and Dolly he got Carter, and, Dolly. yes, and he got um, uh, 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 Harvey Fierstein, who just won the Tony for Torch Song Trilogy, and they came together with La Cage Folle, which is this huge musical in 1983 in the height of the AIDS crisis, mm-hmm. where two men walk off hand in hand at the end, and the audience applauds and loves them. And I remember seeing right. that. Right. Um, he then got to do the Oscars. Oscar Gate was really his... His downfall. And yes. they, but he did the Oscars, the ones with Rob Lowe and Snow White, right. which everyone remembers as being the worst Oscars ever. And they broke it down. And do you remember Beach Blanket Babylon in San Francisco? It was a huge camp show. It was hilarious. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. And that's what the opening was. He took Beach Blanket Babylon, adapted it, for the Oscars with Snow White, and everyone, it was the first time anyone had come from the back of the theater. Snow White comes right. down, and she touches celebrities, and they're all like, oh. you see, like, it's <laughs> like Sigourney a- Weaver going, right. oh. Because it's such a pretense that the Oscars is all classy. They pretend to be, like, yes. better than that. And, and he just did this glitzy thing, right? I mean, was it so bad? It, was it that wasn't. Bad. No, well, no, but you have to really? watch it again. We should watch yes. it. Because now we they bring out pizzas. You know, now it's all about camp, and it's right. all about mixing it up. He invented that. That's- he also invented the and the Oscar goes to yes, right? Because right? it used to be in the winner is he invented and the and the Academy Award goes to. Oh, I don't know that that's really that is. But, but I mean, there's <laughs> that <laughs> is huge. No, but he that's sh- on your gravestone. He, I changed you, the wording you, of and the Oscar goes to. I'm unpacking. Uh, I mean, he made La Cage Fall. He yes. made the yeah, highest yeah, thing no, of no, Greece. No, definitely, definitely and he okay. brought joie. And he's the one with the disco in his basement. Brett Ratner yeah. now lives there. Brett Ratner's in the documentary. Right. I I feel I've done a disservice because I'm I'm unpacking so much. He had a sort of a sad, lonely death, and Nikki Haskell. And I love Nikki Haskell. Steven Gutenberg and uh, Randy Jones from The Village People and Sherry Lansing and Lorna Luff and Michael Musto and Connie Stevens and Alana Stewart and Bruce Valanche, they're all interviewed. I it is a treasure trove. I cannot wait. It's like a, and you know the thing is, though, I think that it's like, you can be gay, but then there is somewhere, some line exactly that right. if you cross, you get, you, are out, you get slapped down. And, and, and it's, what, what is that? I mean, ultimately, it's sort of it's a f- sense that you'll be tolerated, but never really, ex- you're only tolerated on license. Only so long well, but if you cross some sort of line. But it's also that, mm. that we were in a different place is with LGBTQ society, and he was right. very flamboyant at a time where that would be knocked down. You know, I mean, like, he, he got really far, right. but, but I think Hollywood sort of said, you know, yeah. You, After the Oscars, the there was a full-page ad from Julie Sad. Andrews, uh, Blake Edwards, uh, 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 Gregory Peck condemning him and condemning that show. That's, and they were friends of his. Right. And that's, yeah. to me, that kind of slapping, gay boy, you've gone too yeah, far. Yeah, exactly. You've right. gone too far. Step back. Anyway, go I, see, when it comes to you, uh, the fabulous Alan Carr, amazing it's been documentary. It's doing the, it's the, during the festival, festival circuit. circuit. Yes. Right yeah, yeah. But I'm sure it'll be on Netflix soon it's or gonna somewhere. It's going to be picked up, yeah. right? It's so good. So yeah. good. James. <laughs> Number nine, what have you got? Number nine. <laughs> what have I got? <laughs> um, I, I watched a really fabulous documentary, as <laughs> usual. Um, this one was on, it was on Netflix, and it was um, from the BBC. It's called uh, Elizabeth at 90, A Family Portrait. And it's royal home movies of the royal family. And it's um, the BBC made it in 2016 as a gift for Queen Elizabeth when she turned 90 years old. And uh, they went into the Queen's private archives, and they found all these home movies that nobody has ever seen before. That the, nobody in They the probably world, hadn't seen them no, either. No, 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 they hadn't seen them, <laughs> right. because at the time in the 1950s and stuff, they would take it, and then like a guard would come and take it and put it in the archives, and nobody ever seen these. Well, you know in The Crown, right, they like have that whole... 
thing where she's being followed around with film cameras. And oh. I often wondered, like, what happened to that it, well, Exactly, exactly. What you have is you have Charles and Elizabeth sitting and watching some home movies together. Oh, so they make them watch them. Yeah, they make they have a huge screen, and they sit them both down. So it's like and they Royal film them. Goggle Box. Yeah, yes, right? like, Mystery Science Theater. It, exactly. <laughs> then you also have Harry and William watching in another room. Beavis and you Butthead. Have, <laughs> you have Princess Anne in another room by herself. Okay, um. and then you have um, uh, uh, the Duke of Kent, Princess Alexandra and some lesser royals, and they're all in different places watching movies. And everybody's commenting as they're watching these movies. Um, uh, the Guardian uh, is doing it was did, did sort of a roundup of it, and they said while the Duke of Kent points out himself and other dukes, William and Harry <laughs> admire dresses and jewels. Charles says wonderful a lot. The Queen says absolutely nothing, <laughs> and one Princess of them Anne <laughs> scowls, oh. <laughs> which sort of sums up the royal family <laughs> right there. There. But it's fascinating. I was telling you guys yesterday that, to watch it because when Queen Elizabeth does comment, it's always like, oh, that's the Duke of Northumberland who was assassinated <laughs> next to me in 1947, and we used to play dolls together. And, like, she just has these, like, little bits of history. You know, that was the king of Spain who was murdered. And, I, and like, she was there through so much history, and it's just fascinating to, to see her. And she'll go through, and she knows every single mm. person in the background of every single shot don't you think she's sort of just she her whole reign has been there is this person inside who is shrieking and screaming with laughter at the whole thing <laughs> but she's always keeping up this deadpan face and you it's see, like she is her very, royal she has a sort of a sardonic she, totally, wit totally everything is like yes and you, you know, can see this little, little twist the early images of her where she's watching herself as a young girl and she's skipping rope and singing songs oh. and playing and you see that she sort of like misses that like she never she's seeing that for the first time that right. she was once this happy go lucky little child yeah. and right. it's it's a fascinating thing to watch and i just i i it's on netflix it's if you get a chance it's, it's a only, nice companion to the crowd <laughs> it's a nice, is, right? It is a nice companion to the ground. And it's it's only like an hour, but to see the interaction of everybody and to see how bitter Princess Anne is, <laughs> it's just so it's oh. awful. But you see how the give and take between Charles and his mother. And one of the great things is, is Harry and Will are watching their mom, and they're watching a lot of the footage of them as children with their mother that wow. they've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And it's really it's fascinating and interesting. Princess Anne, if you're listening, call us. Let's go out. Let's have some fun. <laughs> oh, poor little Princess Anne. <laughs> What's it called? again it's called uh, elizabeth at 90 a family portrait oh, Wonderful. that's on netflix well at number nine uh number nine you see i cannot count it's like <laughs> i couldn't do the url eight. <laughs> number eight thank you i got a little lag of the jet number eight i went to asia and uh went to south korea and so one of the things i did in south korea we took a trip to the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. Not the TMZ. Not the TMZ, but the TMZ is named after the yeah. DMZ. And the DMZ is like this no man's land. Demilitarized yes. zone. Exactly. It's about it is, it's two and a half miles right. wide and 160 miles long, right across Korea. And the extraordinary thing is you can look out and see North Korea in the distance. Say the South Koreans have decided to turn it into a tourist attraction. And you can get you can get chocolate. You can get DMZ <laughs> chocolate. I got a DMZ notebook, of oh. course. I oh. heart the DMZ. Okay. I, uh, the, and it was absolutely... I love just, the DMZ you know, is what it says. It's yes. really funny. <laughs> and before, you, you're shown a little film before, before you go to the DMZ, uh, sort of outside. And it's a little bit like that Stalker, the uh, Tarkovsky film. You're in this sort of... They, they, they talk about this, this place as a natural wildlife refuge, even though, even though it's seeded with something like a million landmines. So even though there's all this sort of natural fauna and right. fornication and... Is it forestry looking? I imagine it being yes, cementy. It's completely, it's no, it's completely overgrown and lush and gorgeous. And, but you can't, how can the deer live there? I mean, it must occasionally tread on a landmine and go kaboom. Oh, right. oh, yeah. oh Bambi. And it's, it's sort of weird because it's very 1984-ish because even though the, the North and South Korea are separated with this DMZ, they, they talk about reunification all the time. So it's a sort of double think. It's like, on the one hand, it's a border and a very forbidding place. On the other hand, it's a tourist attraction and like, let's reunify. And they've built, they have built a whole train station at the DMZ, which no trains go to. 
and no trains depart from just in case but they in anticipation have of reunification and you can buy a ticket <laughs> it's so brilliant you buy a ticket to go on the platform of the station where no trains go it is brilliant <laughs> <laughs> <or> it's genius <laughs> and the other thing they've done apparently the north koreans um, when the when the DMZ was set up in I think it was in let me see in 1953. Anyway, the North Koreans were unhappy about this, and they decided they would invade South Korea. And the way they would do it is they would build tunnels underneath the DMZ, and they discovered them. The South Koreans discovered them, so you can now <laughs> go oh. down the tunnels that the North Koreans dug the, to planning which, when they were invaded. Yeah. Which is also sort of weird because they found a tunnel and now they turn it into a tourist attraction. So you can walk down this tunnel right up to above you is North Korea. It's just the most extraordinary. Wait, you actually are in North Korea? Well, you're actually on you're the very under. edge of the oh. border. You're under the DMZ. You're in the forbidden zone. And you, if you're a South Korean, you can't go there. But if you're a tourist, you can. If you're a now, dumb tourist so with money to spare, you can go. So no. weird. <laughs> but I imagine there, there's the, like the South Korean border patrols, and then there's North Korean border patrols. Right. And do you get to like interact or see the North Koreans? It's like the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. Yeah, I mean, or you don't, there is actually a station which we didn't visit where there's actually a hut. One end of which I believe is North Korea, oh. and the other end of which is South Korea. But but generally speaking, you don't. You don't. You, but you, you don't like, see any North Korean it's soldiers like or anything. from here to the Hollywood Hills. Oh no, you didn't see. But they are blasting out their different. You know, the, the the South Koreans blast out J-pop, K-pop. I mean, right. And the North Koreans blast out sort of folk songs and propagandistic wow. songs. propaganda music mm -hmm. and agitprop. But um, so you felt safe while you were there. You don't, do you feel danger? Well, uh, everyone said don't go, but I felt totally safe. It was like going to yeah, but you went uh, to North Korea. The Walk of Fame. It was the most sort of yes, but there were hundreds of tourists. It was the most. It was the most bizarre, bizarre. But thing. you realized that during that time, while you were gone, North Korea was launching missiles, and we were on the edge of World War Three. And you know, right, I know. Did you know all of that? Yes, yes, yeah, I read the okay. papers. Yes, but it was like it was business as usual. That they were like selling the chocolate, selling the stamps. Selling the tickets at the railway station, tourists from you everywhere. Know, they keep saying that you know the, the North Koreans have like 90 missiles pointed at Seoul and that they can just blow it up at any well, time. Well, here is indeed the thorny problem, is that having been to North Korea, which is a wasteland basically, you cannot believe how vast and developed mega South Korea is. I mean, Seoul is like five Manhattans wow. stuck together. Yeah. And it is right there. It is half an hour from the border. So... If we go and attack North Korea, all the North Koreans have to do is blow up South Korea. It's yeah. a real stalemate, yeah. sort of interesting situation. And I don't even know that, that Trump understands that because... <sighs> Let's figure that sure. out during the commercial yeah. break. Let's figure that uh, out. Okay, we got to take a break. <laughs> okay, so... Oh. Cute boy alert on the boulevard. Uh -huh. So you can watch the WOW Report uh, at worldofwonder.net slash Radio Andy. On YouTube. Yes. So we have to take a quick break, but the... Trivial question. Yes. It's not a not, trivial it's question. Not a, how dare you <laughs> trivialize this? He's got the this. lag of Such jet. Such an important question. He's got the lag question. of jet. The, the, the question is. Yes. Okay. So Alan Carr, legend of screen. Yes. Uh, producer, legendary, etc. I cannot speak today. He turned down. Uh, well, he turned down two clients, but one in particular. Who did Alan Carr turn down to manage? I mean, one of the gravest cultural mistakes of the 20th century. You're listening to The Wow Report oh, on Radio know. Andy, Sirius XM. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Welcome back to the Wow Report, our countdown of the top 10 things that make us go wow, wow this week. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm Fenton Bailey, co founder of World of Wonder, here with Tom Campbell and James St. James and Blake. Hi. Hi, our millennial producer. How are you? I'm good. Mm. <laughs> so before the break, the question was Alan Carr. Legend of, well, I want to say legend of, what's that expression? It's a Hollywood legend. Ah, yeah, right. Does he have a star on Hollywood Boulevard? I don't think he does. We he should really, work on that. Right. Yeah. Alan Carr turned down two clients, but one in particular was, what a terrible person to, I mean, that, how could he have done it? Who, do I'm you know who it was? Say, um, I'm going to say John Travolta. Oh, it's a really imagine. good guess. I want to guess like someone who was too difficult to work with, like Faye Dunaway. Excellent guess. If you put the two together, you get <laughs> Barry Manilow. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Why, I wonder. I know. 
right? I guess, you know, he probably was just a commercial jingler at that time. I mean, he, up, it would or... have been perfect, right? Alan Carr and Barry Manilow? Or would, was would, it would too... Barry Manilow have felt comfortable I having know. such a gay manager right. at that time? Right. Anyway, that's interesting. He also turned down Julio Iglesias. Oh, what? Julio Iglesias. Bad choice. Okay, so we're moving on, and we've reached number seven. Number seven. James. Tom. Tom. James. Tom. Somebody. Tom. You get the number Somebody right, you get the person wrong. Um, I saw a ghost story. I don't know how you saw it. Where did you see it? It's at the Arclight Theater. <laughs> it's, it's playing it's already. Generally. I've been waiting for this to come out forever. It may be an LA New York thing. Um, it's directed by David Lowry. It stars Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara. And I feel kind of bad because I like to use my wows for good. You know, we get, the, you know, three wows each on this show. <laughs> but this is a what the wow, oh, what the a wow. ghost story. I was really looking forward to this. I'm so upset because I, it well, looks just adorable. You may be in the majority. Okay. Um, I mean, I'd just be too shallow to ex experience this movie because I went and looked at Rotten Tomatoes. My friend Will was like, let's go see a ghost story. I look it up. I just saw like four and a half stars. I'm like, I'm in. I don't want to know anymore. Wow. I go. It's about, it's, it is so slow. It is single camera shots, and the the, the I'm going to explain the plot to you. It, it, Will said it perfectly when we left. He goes, "This would have made a brilliant short film," but it's about this couple, Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara. They're lying on a couch. They live in this small house in some part of Texas. Um, he dies in a car accident, all very artfully done in one shot, one long shot, <laughs> and and he she goes to the morgue to see him. Very slow. She leaves. The camera stays on him for five minutes. And all of a sudden, the sheet covering his body arises, and he becomes a ghost. Casey Affleck is covered in a sheet with cutout holes with some black padding behind them. No, you're and joking. he spends... No, no, wait, wait, wait. What? It's the like rap? Charlie Brown. It's, it's like, like a Charlie... Babadook or something. It's like, it's like the director, supposedly, I've done some reading because mm. I'm trying to comprehend this movie. Mm. It's like, you know, it's it's the most you know basic symbol of of spirit. Uh, uh, and he goes back to the... the emoji ha ghost. And he goes back right. to the house very slow. For some reason, I don't understand ghost powers because he can walk all the way from the morgue to their house, getting no grass stains on his sheet. Mm. And then um, <laughs> he gets there and he can just stand and look. He doesn't say anything for the rest of the movie. He's just observing and he stays. And she, we see like a realtor come and leave a pie for her all in real time. Mm -hmm. Write a note, all in real time. Never see what the note says. Uh, um, uh, um, Rooney comes back and she washes two dishes in the sink, all in real time. Um, then goes over to the pie, reads the note. We don't get to read the note. And then she takes the pie and she eats the pie. And then she eats the pie and she eats the pie and she eats the pie. Then she takes the pie, she sits down on the floor of the kitchen and she eats the whole pie. <laughs> in real time. So it's breakthrough in that you have a very skinny actress on film. Eating a pie. Eating. And then at the end, she goes to the bathroom and she fake throws it up. Because you can tell it's not a real throw up. But it's all done in one shot. But basically it's about longing. It's about him waiting. It's about the people that come in afterwards. And when ghosts get angry, they can just knock shit over. It's like, I want the them to- guys. you right. But I want them to like, like, I want them to have like a good power or something. Mm -hmm. At one point, he looks across to the house across the street and he sees- Another ghost. It's a female ghost, I think, because she has more feminine mm -hmm. sheets, and oh. and they 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 what communicate telepathically with the chirons. And he waves, and she waves, and he goes, "What are you doing?" She goes, "I'm waiting." Alan Chiron, for who? And she goes, "I don't remember." Well, that's very deep. <laughs> it's very profound. See, I'm shallow. No, and, and it seems a little pretentious, and it seems a little twee, but I like pretentious and twee, and I like you know these sort of like this low profundities. Four thumbs up for you then, because you're going to love <laughs> this movie. If you he, love twee, <laughs> if you love pretentious, run, don't walk. But doesn't he, like, also, it like it goes on after her, and then he's still, it's like 100 yes, years later, people and fill, he's still waiting. And oh. then, he, and then so, a, and a huge building is built there. It's suddenly a city. The the ghost is on the top it's of the like building. We're hundreds of years later, he, and he's still waiting. All in one shot. For her, for her. Who, for who, who, who? I don't remember. You know, that's the, that's the thing about ghosts. They don't remember what they're doing. They're just here. They're trapped in limbo. And it didn't make they me. They can't make it to the other side. It didn't. He's a ghost. Okay. It's sad. Do I have a sheet on my head? <laughs> it feels. I almost wore a sheet today. I, I almost wore a sheet today. But, I mean, it is. I mean, it didn't make me angry, but it is. It is. It's like taking our elevator at World it of Wonder. It sounds like you have to surrender to it. Yes. Well, you you know, right. It's like the elevator here at World of Wonder. It yeah. moves so slow. You, okay. you have to just be like, okay. No, you know what it is? It's, it's like Warhol. And it's like. Um, oh. 
oh, it's like okay. these things where it's it's endurance art is what it is. <laughs> and, and you, art. if you make it through, <laughs> you feel good about yourself, and it's better in retrospect than actually sitting through it. Mm. I know these types of movies very well. It's like it's like Dogma or Lar you know all those Lars mm. von Trier movies. It got a very good review. I think the majority is with James. Um, if you're shallow like me, stay away. Ghost story currently in theaters. <laughs> okay, so we've reached number six, James. Number six. Number six. We hit, we go from a small independent movie to a mm. giant blockbuster. War for the Planet of the Apes. Wow. And it's unbelievable. Right. Oh my god. Everyone says it's great. I, you know, I don't know if you guys have been following these movies. Um, mm, I haven't. You really should be. Okay. The first one, Dawn of the Planet mm. of the Apes, was this sort of like little independent movie, and it was James Franco, and he he's an animal biologist, and he has this super smart ape that he teaches to talk. Yeah. And it's just this tiny little film, and it's it's very small in its scope. The second movie, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, is there's been a, a virus. It's the simian yes, virus, yes, and it's right. decimated the human population, mm -hmm. and the apes are now have gotten together and they're being led by this smart ape Caesar, the Caesar who has grown up now with the James Franco ape and he talks and he is teaching the apes to do sign language right. and they're sort of plotting against the remainder of the humans and everything right now but this one you buy it all I believe uh, every no, word it, coming it, out of I'm his mouth I'm telling you it's, it's done it's a so documentary well. but this one this story is huge it just exponentially keeps getting grander and grander in scope <laughs> until it's like Shakespearean this is this is Exodus and the Ten Commandments it's Caesar is Moses and he's leading the apes to the promised land it's it's apocalypse now where Woody Harrelson is the Marlon Brando character and is you know t bogged down in this war that neither side can win oh. and they're sort of like they're, they're fighting with each other it's like saving private Ryan where there's just these horrific <laughs> like battle scenes with the apes being killed and slaughtered and everything oh. like that. There's also, because it's uh, 2017, there's like lots of Trump allegories, and I w they have these, um, there are these turncoat apes who are helping the humans, and they're called donkeys. Trump pansies, as you well, would say. Oh, well, 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 <laughs> exactly, because what they are, if you read into it, the, they're the Republican Senate, who are like, kill, you know, g going against their own constituents mm. and going against their own best interests to to help the wrong person to help this these evil doer yeah, this yeah. evil overlord um uh, this one is told from this perspective of the apes and it's you know the humans are terrible and the apes are just these wonderful moral upright you know you just love them so much uh, afterwards i tweeted let's just give the planet to the apes right now like like we're all horrible let's just let's just get this over Whoa. with there <laughs> is, is it that simplistic <laughs> though <laughs> like no 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 there's nothing simplistic about this oh, movie at all oh. it's it's like these deep themes it's May like I ask a question i heard that the one previous to this rise yeah. what had some sense of humor to it and this one does not is no, that no, true no, no. you know I, in fact that's funny because i was just about to mention that there is a a, a comic relief character in this one and it's um melania it's, the, tr the, the <laughs> <laughs> no it's this this old uh, ape that they rescue from a zoo who can talk and i was trying to, and he sort of talks like this and he's like really cute and he's got these big anime eyes and he's oh no sir please no please and you're trying to figure out who it is and i realized that it's piglet from winnie the pooh <laughs> is who this character is and he's just absolutely wonderful but the big takeaway from this movie yeah. is that andy circus who uh plays caesar right who, he who was Gollum, Gollum in, in Lord, Lord of the, of the Rings, Rings, and he's every kind of sort of anytime you need you have a creature. CGI creature yeah, or whatever. It's because him. It's he's him. a Brit, right? He's a Brit, and it's because that no matter even with Gollum, like it was all CGI, but his humanity comes through, and he's such right. a brilliant actor is that he? he no, he really is. I'm, yeah. No, yeah, how dare you? <laughs> Andy Circus <laughs> deserves a goddamn well, Oscar. Well, he read for those tweets. The, did you see him reading the tweets, the Trump tweets <laughs> yes, in yeah. the Gollum speak? Yeah. Yes. That was, but but, yeah, but yeah. the thing about this is he's. Caesar and he's really hot as an ape and like like he's really <laughs> oh, like James, no I James would, you crossed a new line no, no. I would totally do Caesar oh. I would totally like I like I just he's really a hot well, ape well obviously he came he saw he conquered your heart <laughs> he conquered oh. my heart he did he's really if you get a chance to see this I don't know if you need to see the other two to for it to make sense but just know that the apes are the good guys and the humans are the bad guys and you can go and watch right. it it's fabulous Planet of the Apes in theaters now at number five. Number five. I was in Tokyo recently. <laughs> <laughs> what a tour of Just East Asia. Week as I was. And I went to the robot restaurant. 
life-changing experience. I gotta what tell is you, a robot restaurant? You, Tokyo, you gotta go to the robot restaurant. It's down this little street in Shinjuku, and you basically buy your ticket in one place. I mean, it's built for tourists. It is a tourist trap, like the DMZ, actually. <laughs> this is the second tourist trap ex- uh, thing. Uh, you buy your ticket, which is like, oh, I don't know, 50 bucks, something like that. And you then descend a staircase. I mean, you go so far down, you think it's really hot. It's infernally hot. You think you're like feeling the heat of the Earth's core. It's so hot. I mean, into this little basement that must be five stories below ground. And there's two lines of spectator seats on a sort of runway in the middle. And then they put on this amazing show with these giant creatures that come out and do battle right in front of you. And they like literally clear the ceiling by an inch. I mean, and they're all sort of spewing fireworks and pyrotechnic. The whole thing is completely insane. It makes no sense. I mean, first is a sort of, first part is some sort of battle between good and evil, a bad robot and a sort of turn On a stage or on the floor? On the floor in okay. front of you. So it's like, it's like a runway fashion show, uh-huh. but you've got bad robot sort of monster things coming from here, bad robots coming from here, doing battle, and then they have a, a section, actually Alan Carr would have loved this. <laughs> they, they, well, they have an intermission like every five minutes where it's like, buy more drinks, you know, <laughs> buy more food. But then they also have this number, which is sort of disco party, <laughs> and it's YMCA, and they have these giant robot transformer characters. It's literally YMCA? Doing YMCA. See, Alan Carr knew. all just come around. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. And the whole thing is completely insane. It makes no sense, but it's, it's kind of fantastic. It's really Do robots fantastic. serve you or people uh, yeah, serve do, you? Yeah, you go have people dinner? People serve you and they, they push carts around. I mean, they're just pl- they, they are selling you all the time. I mean, it's so brilliant. So it's just so brilliantly like they have they say, "Oh, last last chance to go to the bathroom." And then 5 minutes later, last chance to go to the bathroom and like buy, you know, popcorn and cotton candy and things like that. Oh, so that. it's not really a cafe, it's more of like a it's, it's like a, oh, a well, you medieval can, times for robots. Right. Well, you can it, <laughs> very well put. It's break like, it um, down. What James. do they call those things? Um Jousting. Oh, they, it's yeah, kind of set up that's like that's a joust. Yes. It's just like a joust. And the, the people selling the popcorn and shit are in the middle, and you can eat there. I mean, it's not recommended because the food is awful and it's really expensive, and you have to pre order it like on an airplane. So they bring it, like, here's your food. But you can buy all these little, you know, key rings and souvenirs and things. How b- now, w- our studio is in an empty store space here on Historic Hollywood Boulevard. It is indeed. How yeah. big was the robot restaurant compared to the space here? The robot restaurant was the size of this entire room. <coughs> So we yeah. could, ha- so we we could, could have, have two- we could, we should be doing that. <laughs> Giant drag queen characters with <coughs> enormous styrofoam heads. Now, yes. these are actual robots or are there people no, inside? Well, with, that's the with other thing. They're pretty, they're, there are people on them, sort of clambering all over them, and they're remote controlled. So they come out, they do their thing, they pirouette, they turn, they do battle, they spew fire at each other, and then they retreat. But the whole thing is programmed. It's like, it's a computerized show. It's absolutely amazing. I hope you got a business card. Let's collaborate. Let's bring it out here. Robot Restaurant is located in Tokyo's Shinjuku district and open every day from 3 p.m. to 12 p.m. You have to make a reservation. Shinjuku-robot.com. Robots are hot right now. There you go. Bot or not, okay? (laughs) Okay, so we have to take a quick break. But here's the question. You know, Planet of the Apes is enjoying a resurgence. But it's, it's an old franchise, for want of a better word. How many films in total? How many Planet of the Apes films are there in from total? From the, the spinoffs from the Charlton Heston. From the version. original yes. Charlton Heston okay. one, yes. Hey, we'll have the answer right after the break. You're listening to The Wow Report on Radio Andy, Sirius XM. Yes. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Hey, welcome back to The Wow Report. <laughs> Our countdown of the top 10 things that made us go wow this week. I'm here with James St. James, Tom Campbell, hello, hello. Blake Jacobs. Hi, hey, hi. Blake, <laughs> I gave you a second name. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <gasps> so the question was, Planet of the Apes, how many films in total are there in this sort of mega franchise? From the original franchise. From the original, right, which reboot. dates from the 70s, right? There 60s. Was, there was Planet You're of the Apes. In the 60s? Yep. <gasps> there was Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Right. There was Beyond the Planet of the Apes. There was Rise of the Planet of the Earth. The War for the Planet. Uh, yes. I th- I'm going to say there were five. I'm going to say there were six. I'll say seven. The but answer is five. 
Oh. Uh, that was so Planet good. of the Apes. Because remember they Wait, wait, wait. Let's hear. Planet of the Apes, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, Escape from. Oh, right. Yeah. Conquest of. Oh, yeah. And then Battle for the Planet of the Apes. Right. Remember they go back They go back to the in time to the Earth, and then they give their child to the uh, the, the circus? You are so deeply invested in the right. Planet of the Apes. I, this is a whole new wait, side wait, of you. You never watched them as a I child? watched the first one. I remember that one. Well, they get real. They're really I mean, good. It's just that great visual moment, right? Charlton Heston on the horse. Yes, yeah, seeing Statue the Statue of Liberty. Liberty. No, but actually it gets better because then Zara and Cornelius take a trip back to 1977 and they dress in 70s clothes <laughs> and they're, they're, they're being hunted. They become celebrities in, in America in the 70s, in the disco era, and then they have a child, but then the, the America, everybody turns on them. I want to see uh, Alan no, Gods. No, no, wait, oh, oh, oh now I remember it, James. No, 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 now no, I remember But it's got this great ending. It's got an even better surprise ending I, than oh, the first one I, because they have a child. That's, they're being chased by the military, and they switch with the uh, some uh, with an ape in the circus, and then they gun down the baby, and then you see the circus tr train take off, and there's a little baby going, "Mama, mama, mama," and you realize that that's how the Planet of the Apes starts because they had gone back in time and left their baby. If you put all the films together. Is it a coherent it narrative? It is a it, very coherent narrative. It, all of the, the films, the new films and the original films. Yes. Yes. It yes. all makes sense. And actually, so, in this okay. film, you see the kernel, the seeds of what happened in the other one with with Cornelius Jess, and Zeros. I hate to cut you off, but for winning the, uh, getting the answer right, I give you a... <laughs> Uh, what is it? Oh, an aloe mask sheet of uh, oh, a of mask. Of yeah, you put a K-pop band on your face. Yes. Delightful. Yeah. I'm jealous. Okay, moving on. Number four, Tom. Number four. RuPaul's Drag Race. Yes. We hardly ever mention that we show here. <laughs> we never talk about it. Um, we'd be remiss not to say with all kinds of gratitude that RuPaul's Drag Race in its ninth season. Unbelievable. Has just received eight Emmy nominations, eight, as the number after seven and before nine. It never <laughs> happens. It never it happens. It never happens. Best host mm -hmm. and best reality competition, which it's it's like against the amazing race and the voice and these huge shows. Also, makeup, hair, costumes, casting, and get this, Untucked, which is the show within the show, which used to be on after the show, which is now on our YouTube channel, it Wow is, Presents. Yeah. It's a digital show. And it is uh, nominated for Emmy for Unstructured Reality Show against like shows on AE. Like Deadliest Catch, things of that nature. <laughs> yes, thank you. But this is one of those Deadliest things. Deadliest Snatch. <laughs> this is one of those things that we've been saying all along where hair and makeup and, and costumes, these are such no brainers that it's so nice that the Academy is finally coming around. They should have been gotten, they should have gotten those in uh, season one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, but I, it's just, it's an amazing moment. Yeah. You know, we're on VH1 this season. Yeah. Lady Gaga was on the first episode. The the show is being uh, appreciated by and exposed to people that hadn't seen it before. Highest ratings we've ever gotten. And, you know, a lot, I, th I think if you ever have voted for nominations on the Emmys, it's an endless list oh, of shows. It's a whole day. And long. every year they, they, the list gets bigger and bigger. Right. Because yeah. TV and it, just gets bigger. It makes you feel rotten for me because you're like, oh my God, I haven't watched any of these or some of them. And so then you start to feel like, oh, I better put something down, something classy, and I better check, check, check. But, you know, obviously we go for all our own shows. But it speaks to, I mean, World of Wonder is, is a nice size organization, but we're not here. Huge <laughs> and and logo and VH1, you know, a lot of these companies are are are, are end them all are huge companies, mm -hmm. so they have these huge voting blocks behind them, right? Mm -hmm. The people, mm -hmm. and I think our secret weapon in this is 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 the gay, are gay people who are members of the academy and straight people and mm -hmm. allies. But I think there's this that people are are abandoning just voting for their own shows or their own network to say Drag Race means something, you know, now more than ever. And, um, you know, whether we win or not, who knows, but we're going to talk about nominations for the next couple of months because it's, <laughs> it's pretty exciting. It's very exciting. And I just saw the, uh, the just this amazing clip of this weatherman. <laughs> right. Right? Well, I was going right. to say, while Emmy nominations are great, the real reward came in, yeah. in the form. It was a Welsh BBC presenter named Owain Wynne Evans, and he gives the weather report on the BBC, and he uses Win. one. Winning. One drag race. You saw it, right? Yeah. One drag race brilliant. pun after another. He's like, I hope you didn't get Courtney Acton any downpours. And that <laughs> sunshine, Charlie hides behind all those clouds for some time. But we'll, we'll be saying hi to blue skies as we head into the afternoon. <laughs> That's just a little it sample. Was the whole weather report, right? It yes. was absolutely brilliant. It went viral. You know, it's, it's interesting, too, because, you know, 
Rue is just on a personal career high. That this has probably been one of the greatest years uh, in the the past thirty five years of her career. Yeah. where she's gotten the, where she got the Emmy last year. She was you know the cover the best of host Entertainment Weekly this you June. Know, yes, I mean you know she's got married. She's you know there's just there's so many great things that are happening for her right now, and it's just it, she's really worked very hard and deserves uh, every. Minute and of it. we produce the show, and we you know obviously Rue is amazing. Is the is the creative force behind it? I still never take for granted that RuPaul's Drag Race is on the air. It's a show that, wow. for some reason, should never have been on the air. I know that sounds crazy. We talk about Alan Carr being beat up and shot down. It's like Logo wasn't doing shows about drag queens. They didn't right. want to. It's like right. they had a different agenda, and yeah, not yeah, a bad yeah, agenda. Yeah, right, but they had a different agenda of how to sort of assimilate because they had to. And there was, I feel like there was one after it was one month. One week, one day, when we pitched a show with RuPaul, which made all the difference, about drag, that somebody said yes. Yes. Because we pitched it everywhere, and one place said yes, and it was Logo. And for the last eight years, we were kind of the only hit on Logo to live, and now we're on VH1, and we're getting this recognition. And it's and many times, it could have been pulled off the air, or it wasn't a priority, it wasn't mm-hmm. important, it was this marginal thing, and now it gets this kind of recognition. Don't take it for granted, because I still think any moment, not to be paranoid, but it could go away. You know, the pendulum swings both ways. So this is an exciting moment to to be grateful and thankful that we have this these nominations. And we are. Thank you. Right. Congrag relations. All around. Congrag Namaste, relations. darling. <laughs> <laughs> James, what have we got for us at uh, number three? Number three. Well, this is one of those things that that just makes you go, wow. Not wow. <laughs> wow. What? What's going what? on? Do go, what is it? It's, um, it's, it's, it's our true crime <laughs> oh. segment. Yes. Um, we have two stories that really got to me this week. The first one is these explosive allegations about R. Kelly's alleged sex cult, yes. which is just icky and weird. Um, it's the... Um, uh, BuzzFeed broke the story, which is, you know, BuzzFeed has been sort of on a journalistic kick lately, and they've mm-hmm. been breaking a lot of interesting stories. Uh, he, they broke the news that Kelly keeps this group of young women at his home in Atlanta where he controls every aspect of their lives. They aren't allowed to go to the bathroom unless he says it's okay. They aren't allowed to at, eat or drink water unless he says it's okay. He films all their sexual activities. Uh, he, they have to call him daddy. Um, the parents have, have not spoken to their kids. They're all of age. They're, it's not – underage kids or women but uh he just he it's it's very weird and strange and when the news came out um his lawyer linda mensch defended the singer as a great artist who takes care of all the people in his life which is a sort of a strange you may have water now (laughs) and then she continued and she said like all of us mr kelly deserves a personal life which is one of these weird, like, non-denials, like, what really is going on there? And then later she said, you know, uh, Mr. Kelly is both alarmed and disturbed by the recent revolutions attributed to him, and it's not true, and he will fight vigorously. Did someone the bust him? Did one of these women bust yeah, him? Well, the, the parents have been saying, have been uh, worried about their daughters, and they uh, went to BuzzFeed, and BuzzFeed has been trying to break the story forever. So what's going to um, happen next? Well, we don't really know, and I want to move on to the next story. Because <laughs> yeah, some people are defending him. That story is still, still yes. and unfolding. He's, de- he's defending himself, and one of the girls came forward and says that it's not right. true, blah, 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 blah. But the other story. Hold on one second. Um, oh. He's getting two stories for I one. Know. I know. You're packing a lot of value. No, 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 but this is the one, this is the one that really, we can cut that other one down. Like, whatever, <laughs> because this one really upset. This is Aaron Carter, bless mm. his little heart, who was arrested for DUI and possession and he um a picture uh, says a thousand words well for a I mean, words. that's okay. really all you his that, mugshot that's is so part sad two oh, of the story because looks the so fr- tired well yes okay the first thing though is when he was arrested his brother nick carter from yes. backstreet boys tweeted out his support saying right. i love you bro i'm here for you blah 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 and um aaron really got pissed off by that oh. and said how dare you grandstand on Twitter, if you really love me, you would have come to me privately and you wouldn't have done this whole public, like, I'm here for you, blah, blah, blah. If you really love me, don't shame uh. me in front of everyone, which is, he sort of got a point, you know, but on the other hand, it's addiction, and you Sounds know that where you're pushing away dysfunctional. everyone who's well, trying exactly to help is. you. I mean, it's already out there, so it's not like Aaron, uh, it, not, not, not like his brother. You probably want to keep a distance from somebody who's <laughs> yeah. mel- 
melting down, you know? Yeah. Well, the other part of the story is the 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 um the mug shot which went viral, triple I viral. It is triple or, viral. Know, what's drug? <laughs> it is the worst mug shot. It, it it makes that James Brown mug shot look like Matthew Anderson yeah. portrait. You know, <laughs> it's just it is. I mean, he look, he's twenty nine years old. He looks oh. about fifty nine years yeah, old. Yeah, it's like yeah. a faces of meth thing. Yeah. And yeah. Um, on the talk, they were talking about him. On the talk, they were talking about him. And um, <laughs> he had a meltdown and, and went on a Twitter rampage saying, uh, hey, Mrs. Osborne, hey, Aisha Taylor of the talk, I am not an addict, I am not on crack, to claim such derogatory, uh, the, to claim such derogatory statements is sick. He then, um, he said, I will not continue to tolerate such lies about me regarding drug use, alleged meth, heroin, crack, it's not funny, which if he isn't, and he just looks like crack, and he, I mean, he looks like crap and he was on pot or whatever, I don't know, we don't know what the state of his, of, yeah. of his addiction is. But then, Twitter did what Twitter does, and they went off about the picture, and they really went in on him pretty hard. They were really vicious, and uh, he said he tweeted, "The body shaming must end now. It's amazing how many of you can hide behind your screens and type these things, but wouldn't say it to my face." He said, "Ending this with the fact that there's so many bullies out there, and this male body shaming must continue to be addressed." And it's. It is sort of true because also the same week Ed Sheeran was was slammed for his appearance on the Game of Thrones and but just two different uh, yes no 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 but, but the but fact is this the Twitter people can be so nasty Twitter's yes, horrible that's true. and Twitter people are mean and if you're going to be on Twitter then you have to play the Twitter game and you have to have a thick skin but just you know the Ed Sheeran thing was a weird cameo and this Nick thing I don't know what it is but it's it's a sad. No, but but that there is a body shaming thing that's going on, and if he just does, you know, in other pictures he doesn't look quite as bad, and there, he gave an interview that he doesn't. But people have been really cruel about his looks right. and about. I, I just I feel bad for the kid because I've looked really bad in, in the midst of drug addiction before. I I've seen the pictures. You put it up on <laughs> twenty foot tall on a movie screen, and um, I thought you looked great though, yeah. James. Just so you and know. I remember when people gasped when they saw me at they how did, bad yes, I looked, yes, yes. and it felt. So so awful and it was like one of those like real come to Jesus moments mm -hmm. where it, like I've got to like change my life but I don't know if he so, if this is but that helped you, know, you. That was a good it thing, did right? but I just I know the pain that it feels of, of being like made fun of that's for fair your, you know you look like crap I don't know how to segue <laughs> 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 but um, you know I hope Aaron Carter gets the help he needs and that it, it works out right and he doesn't tweet us angrily yes well, I love you, Aaron Carter. <laughs> well, I just do remember that single, Aaron's Party, Come Get yes. It. So just <laughs> he was fun. So, just such a beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. Number two. Number two. I was in London recently, and I went to see the Pink Floyd exhibit. World at the Traveler. Victoria and Albert Museum. You know, there's this trend, like McQueen, they did the, you know. BMA David Bowie. Did the McQueen, David Bowie. It's a sort of trend of making museums hot by doing these great pop star exhibits. I like that. Most recently, Pink Floyd, I well, have to say. Yeah. Well, my question is, yes. like, really, what is there about Pink Floyd that is museum worthy and what <gasps> makes it so fascinating? Album covers. Oh, God. Well, exactly. No, I mean, they are the quintessential 70s concept band. That's true. Right? I mean, dark side of the moon i tell you i went to this i went to the exhibit like it's sort of you know a little ambivalent like right. why am i really going do i really need to see this and i was sort of overwhelmed with memory pain and seeing memory you're in the sort of dark <laughs> corridor and seeing that 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 iconic cover and hearing with the prism right yes the, yes the prism with the light refracted mm -hmm. and then hearing the sounds of time dun, 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 yeah. dun, dun, dun. it's very portentous and over the top and very sort of pump rock as only the 70s could have been but it was so pump rock is that we called it pump rock okay. yeah it's pump rock pump. and of course it. you know i mean pump rock met its demise at the hands of punk you know it was like in 76 uh, you know johnny rotten and sex pistols and what have you kind of like said enough and in fact one of the key Sex Pistol moments was Johnny Rotten wore uh, a Pink Floyd T-shirt, which he had modified to say, I hate Pink Floyd. Oh. So he's wearing an official, and that is in the museum. So, I mean, I suppose there is a little bit of everything taking itself a little bit seriously. You know, like, does rock and roll really belong in a museum? But 
I suppose for an aging generation who bought those records, people like me, to go, it's like watching a documentary. You go into the museum yeah. and there's sort of sights and sounds and it's it's the just terribly well, I do nostalgic remember that and the movie. The, oh, I'm sorry. I, mm. I do remember that the movie The Wall really spoke to me when I was like a 12 or 13 years old. I saw it like 20 times, I think, in the theater. Right. Do they play it there? Do they have yes, like, they the do, videos? Yes, they do. I mean, they do, they do sort of each album. You know, I mean, there were a few before Dark Side of the Moon, but that was a big breakthrough. Wish You Were Here, the ultimate 70s album with the most amazing artwork and to see it large and big and to see how they made it it's kind of interesting hypnosis was the design company that did all the design uh and animals of course with the in giant inflatable pig strung up between the towers of battersea oh. power station which then broke loose remember it broke loose and they had to close down the airport and all flights into london were cancelled because this giant pig was That's floating so good. this is, one of the <laughs> this is british ball. history sort of pre-viral before <laughs> viralness you know, this, do you remember a couple of years ago in L.A. there was the Diane von Furstenberg exhibit? Yes, it's just like that. It's very, it's but it's like very that. Warhol, right? I mean, it's, it's like, like Alan pop. Carr. Where's the Alan Carr exhibit? Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. I would, I would Wait, go and see John. Wait, how are you guys tying in Diane von Furstenberg into because the wall? It's pop culture. I'm just saying it's it's the idea that the subject matter can be like like Warhol made art out of pop culture things, and now pop culture is becoming art. Oh. When Warhol oh. Oh. Can in the museum, and now you can take pop culture, the ephemera of pop culture, and you can museumize it. Yes. And it's Actually, the results are stellar. It really can. And if you're having an emotional reaction, isn't well, that I don't necessarily have an emotional reaction I when I go to other it. exhibits. Sometimes I, I do, but not I, always. I, I, I cry. What are some of the other things that were there? What were some of the uh, items? Well, some. Uh, I mean, having said all that, some of it's a bit ridiculous. I have all the, <laughs> they have all the original synthesizers. And, you know, it does. It is a little bit up its own ass, frankly. <laughs> but you can but, take what you like and leave the rest well, behind, exactly. right? And I'll tell you this little bit of trivia. That amazing cover for Dark Side of the Moon. Yeah. Hypnosis went to the Pink Floyd, and Pink Floyd were like, oh, God, not another concept cover. We don't want another concept cover. And they loved the Black Magic chocolate box. Now, I don't know if you had Black Magic chocolates no. here. They were this quintessence. They were very classy. You know, if you wanted to impress someone, you'd give them a box of Black Magic chocolates. That's funny. And the box was very minimal. It was just basically black. So Hypnosis went away saying, because Pink Floyd said, we yep. want something like the Black Magic chocolate box. And that's how they came up with the prism. Because it's basically the cover uh, of Wish you, of uh, Dark Side of the Moon is basically black. Yeah. It's like the Black yeah. Magic chocolate box. That's great. Oh, that's yeah. funny. But of course, then there's the, the sort of conundrum is, you know, they were very anti-capitalism and, and things of that nature. But then you exit, as one does, exit through the gift shop and mm -hmm. there's like, you know, pig cufflinks and little inflatable pig Where, where are our and gifts? And where I'm ready to, to receive our, our gifts. <laughs> I'm just well, yeah, you've got your face mask. <laughs> I do have my face mask. We got some out. <laughs> <laughs> Pink Floyd, their mortal remains is on exhibit at the Victorian Albert Museum in London through October 1st. Okay. Got to take a quick break. When we come back, yes. our resistor of the week yes. and our number one thing this week that made us go. Wow. wow. It's the Wow Report on Radio Andy, Sirius XM. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. It's time to reveal our number one thing. This week it is. Number one. Pete Buttigieg. Oh. Mayor, Mayor Pete. Pete. Mayor Pete. Mayor Pete. Because that last name is hard. Just a little, yes, Mayor Pete. Just a little bit of background. You know, here we are in Trump land. Mm. There was a poll that came out recently that said, you know, that the Democratic Party doesn't, see, people don't think it stands for anything other than anti-Trump. And we always say among ourselves, who's our next leader? Who's on the horizon? And Who are our, the young people yeah, that are going to energize Kamala the Harris party? we talk about and, and, and Cory Booker. And on CBS this morning, yes, I'm an old man. I watch CBS in the morning. They had Mayor Pete from South Bend, Indiana, and he's a Harvard graduate, which I guess is a bad thing these days. But he's a smart ding, guy, ding, 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 ding. Oxford Rhodes Scholar, ding, 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 ding. Afghanistan War veteran, ding, 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 ding. and he's 35 years old, and he's the mayor of West Bend, Indiana, and he's on there yeah. in, in this Triple kind of like threat. introducing himself to the world, and they're asking with Charlie Rose and, and Nora Donnell. He's, he's cute. He has sort of a Kennedy like a yes. Kennedy esque look about him. Mm. He's a Adorable he, and he's charismatic. He feels like a small town, no nonsense, make you know, smart, but can communicate directly. Yeah, a real Didn't communicator. Didn't rise to any of the baits. No, and and and, they, and and because the morning he was on, it was yeah. the morning that the health care bill collapsed. And he said, "We have to ask you. You know, you're a 
mayor, how does this health care collapse affect the people in where you live? And he said, you know, it's he goes, first of all, obviously, it's great because Obamacare c- continues in one way or another for a little bit of a while. But he said, you know, he goes, this isn't about, you know, this is about people. And he said, this affects people. And he goes, my partner's mother my partner's mother. And we realized, ding, he's, ding, 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 he's <laughs> gay. Oh, but he God. said, he, my partner's mother is a, takes a cream as chemotherapy for skin cancer, and if she, you know, she doesn't have insurance, it costs her $3,500 a month and she can't afford it. But it was the, 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 it was that moment where all of a sudden, every LGBTQ person in America went, what? Yes. And it wasn't. And we realized, sorry. you know, because, you know, they, they, they're speaking him up in the very beginning. They're saying that he's, there's a possible gubernatorial run. Yes. There's a possible Senate run. He, they, he say he even might go as far as presidency and when you realize that we might have a queer the first gay president a gay president in our lifetime like it, it's within our reach now like right. it, it wasn't before he may be our first gay president but i think if trump is impeached or leaves and pence becomes president pence will be our first gay president he'll just be uh, he'll just be living uh, in the closet thank you but um he was just i i will put the link to the uh interview which was a really nice lengthy beefy interview mm-hmm. and they were just throwing questions at him right and left and he had such a composure I and i thought they were kind of antagonistic well I because they, they are it's cbs sort of, and they are a bit republican it's there like, and what's wrong with the democrats being anti-trump like since when is that a problem but just yeah, like what's, what do we stand for i think is what he's saying and, and he, mm-hmm. he had a good answer because yeah, he was like you know he's like he said he was in new york because bloomberg had put together this like coalition oh, of like right. 50 mayors so they could work together and mayor con mayor con to sort of figure out how they could they could govern better and he said you know what i would be i've just spent the last three days with them because i'd be hard Hard pressed to tell you if they were Democratic mayors mm. or Republican mayors, and that politics is local. And he goes, and when you're filling potholes and you're building infrastructure, you're giving jo- uh, jobs on that, building jobs on that level, that's meaningful. And he goes, he goes, any advice? He goes, don't pay attention to Washington. We're obsessed with Washington right now. Not don't pay attention, but like it's it's a big show. It's a big carnival now. And right. not let's not forget the the values that we share and the things that we all want in common. And that it's not Democrat or Republican. Yes. He also had a really great quote about how they asked him about being gay or being LGBTQ or something like that. And he said, you know, when I was in Afghanistan, ding 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 ding. Yes. And they did when I was driving that truck. Care. They didn't yes. care if I had went home to a a man or a woman it was just if i knew where i was going and if i could get them trained to defend our nation he's really powerful and so he brought in like all of a sudden the army people loved him like everybody loves this guy he's very charismatic very like we said easy on the eye and i think he's gonna go all the way i'm so excited he also and at the very end they were like so you came out as gay in 2015 what is that like what are the what you know they're trying to like create a sad story he goes listen because i came out in an eloquent letter in 2015 that i was gay he goes and i had election after that and i won 82% 82% of the vote in South Bend, Indiana. South Bend, Indiana, which so, is a red state. You know, let's let's face it. So that's very exciting. Mayor Pete, because his last name's too hard to say, but it's Pete <laughs> Buttigieg. 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 Yeah. Buttigieg. Mm. Okay. So just quickly, resistor of the week, anyone? Bianca Del Rio. That's right. <laughs> so uh, what are we calling this? Cultigate? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, Delta just earned their stripes, right? By like, <laughs> moving her seat or something ridiculous. And she went on a just tr- can't take it. The, the, the woman who complains about liberals being snowflakes and much worse mm. had a Twitter meltdown because she was moved from her $30 extra legroom seat on Delta. And she went on a Twitter storm. And none other than Bianca Del Rio had the perfect retort. Can you read the little exchange? Well, yes. Uh, Bianca Del Rio first said, love you, Delta Airlines and Culter is a rotted cunt. You can say that. <laughs> You're British. Say, Hashtag miserable bitch. Then Ann Coulter said, and of course, at Bianca Del Rio is being very classy, as always, hate me as much as you can. To which the Bianca Del Rio replied, yes, I am classy. First classy. <laughs> Hashtag coach flying cunt. Hashtag back of the blame. <laughs> See you next Tuesday. Because really Bianca good, does right? travel the world in her sold out shows and she does fly first class, darling. <laughs> <laughs> She does. So, you know, Ann Coulter is awful, and anyone that can knock her down, she's almost an easy target, but I think... uh, It really, as much as we hate the airline industry right now, you got to give it to Delta. I think I'm going to be flying Delta for a while. You wonder what Delta did, because, like, the last time that Delta was in news, they were beating up passengers, (laughs) right? So, amazing. That's all we have time for today. Oh, tune in for Million Dollar Listings, New York, Thursdays, uh, 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock Central on Bravo. RuPaul's Drag Race revealed yes. season nine on logo every thursday at 8 p.m 
And on Sunday nights, tune into HGTV for two brand new episodes of Island Hunters at 10 p.m. It's a huge hit. Season huge. four, we huge. broke the records. We, we beat Game of Thrones, I lie. But we did very well on Sunday with the new uh, Island Hunters. Thanks for tuning in to The Wow Report on Radio Andy Sirius XM. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Benton. Thank you, James. Thank you, Blake. Thank you. Uh, listen anytime on the Sirius Radio app or watch anytime on the Wow Report yes. and see all the bits that we have to cut out with James. <laughs> 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 same time, same place next week, okay? Yeah. Until then, go out and do something that makes the world go wow! wow.